Simon Creative and Papuya Games may not have been the first to cross the finish line when creating an anime Souls-like, but they at least hold the current record for the cutest Souls-like with Papuya's debut game, Little Witch Nobita. Cuteness aside, Nobita is also one of the more unique takes on the genre, combining the classic melee stamina and dodge roll systems with a stronger focus on third-person shooting mechanics, which leans into Nobita's character as a witch. Given the niche nature of the game and the companies that made it, expectations are best set up front for something of a budget title, but for the right player those budgetary constraints may very well be part of the appeal. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tarx, these are my gauntlets, and this is the game we're putting through the gauntlet today. But before we get the ball rolling on this video, this product was provided to me for free by Idea Factory. So if you like what you see here and want to see more, maybe check out my unboxing video of the collector's edition. Let's bust. <laughs> this is all terrible. Or swing by their store to see about picking up a copy for yourself. And of course, all my thanks is owed to them and to you guys for watching. With all that said, let's get into Little Witch Nobita by checking out its story first. Like most Souls-like titles, Little Witch Nobeta isn't a game driven heavily by story. The game begins with our titular witchular Nobeta approaching the outside of a castle estate, waxing about how reaching the throne within could help her realize the purpose of her journey, or uncover the memories she feels she had lost. A short ways inside, she comes across a black cat who she understands should be leading the way, whom, after rescuing, becomes Nobeta's own Virgil. The cat, still having its memories, leads Nobeta through the strange estate overrun with hostile spirits, explaining the various states of the world around her and how she is best to progress. Only, Nobeta is not as humble a follower as Dante was, often shirking her leader's instructions to go her own way, following whims into tangents that, while providing additional gameplay and padding the length of the game, are more filler than anything. But without the filler, this would be an extremely short adventure. And in context to the genre, it's already quite a short one, taking on average 12 hours for a single playthrough and less than 15 hours to 100% without doing New Game Plus. And while I find the filler and main plot itself inoffensive, as it is ultimately just a means to an end, that end being to fuel an adventure for our game, the antagonist's motivations in the game and supporting dialogue simultaneously try way too too hard while not trying at all. For example, the 10 seconds after meeting a character for the first time, which coincidentally is also just 60 seconds before killing them, is not a good window of time to engage in a deep, meaningful, philosophical conversation about life and being alive. Dialogue like this in times like this goes nowhere and implodes into nothingness. But we're not really here for any of that. We're here for the gameplay. And on that front, Little Witch Nabita does, at least, marginally better. Gameplay-wise, Little Witch Nabita hits a lot of the Souls-like hallmarks. Dungeons utilize a good amount of shortcuts and hidden areas, as well as a statue-based checkpoint system where you respawn after death, as well as spend your resources to level up across a variety of stats, some of which are far more useful than others. Unlike most Souls-like games, you do not lose your resources upon dying, nor is there an Estus Flask type of item that replenishes at the checkpoint. Rather, healing is more akin to the grass system from Demon Souls, where one time use items that restore HP or MP separately are picked up from barrels and other items usually found around the checkpoints. Your bag space for consumables is limited and items do not stack, but your bag space can be expanded by finding upgrades hidden throughout the world. The need for consumables, however, is somewhat uncommon, as most resources can be replenished through other means, be it killing enemies or destroying objects throughout the world. On the environments, a lot of them are fairly open but also empty-ish spaces. This is mostly due to budgetary constraints, but it does lend a unique feeling to the game, as if Nobeta is exploring a large dollhouse rather than a real place, which is doubled down on with later elements of the story and the characters. For instance, the vast majority of bosses are puppet girls or dolls brought to life. This dollhouse type feeling was most likely created by accident and something I probably uniquely experienced while going through the game and was almost entirely unintentional, but it was certainly there for me. 
In terms of the combat, we have some genre staples here as well, such as melee attacks, a stamina meter, a parry ability, and the world's slowest dodge roll, which could more aptly be referred to as a dodge fall or tumble. Despite being staples, none of these are the reliable systems you may be familiar with. Melee attacks are not a reasonable means to dispatch enemies beyond the early stretches of the game, but they do have another function we'll get into in a little bit. For the stamina meter, this is more crippling than your average game, as it causes our titular witch to super Super Smash Bros. Brawl when it completely drains, and her recovery time is akin to a backed turtle. The parry ability is one of the toughest things in the game to master, and it does take some adjusting to, but like all parry abilities, it's just a matter of timing. In this game, you do not deflect attacks with a shield, but rather a well-timed melee attack. This game offers no actual guard mechanic. Now, I'll be honest, I either forgot or didn't know there even was a parry until about the halfway point of the game. It's good to get used to if you're aiming for high level play, but wholly unimportant to master. The dodge roll, while slow, is at least somewhat reliable. It can just be a little hard to adjust to as bosses tend to have really long windups to moves and the roll cannot be spammed. It's simply too long of an animation to be useful for spamming. A cruel lack of iframes between hits Hits as well will ensure your need to master the dodge mechanics, whether it be rolling, running, or jumping to avoid attacks. And that lack of iframes really can be quite cruel. Due to the limited viability of melee attacks, most combat comes down to ranged magic attacks, which is where Nabita really carves out its own identity. Throughout the course of the adventure, Nabita unlocks four different offensive spells, each with what's essentially a standard and alt fire, the alt fire attacks being called chants. Chants sometimes have special use cases in puzzle solving, but are generally more powerful versions of the standard fire. But the catch is they take a long time to cast, as Nabita has to focus and recite a spell to properly use it. Chanting causes your momentum to take a hit, and any attack that would down Nabita would cancel the chant. Standard fire attacks are also out of the question while a chant is being performed. However, melee attacks can drastically speed the chant up. Otherwise, the four spells you get operate similar to weapons in a normal third-person shooter. Arcane is your basic starter pistol type weapon. Its fire rate is slow, but the range and damage is decent. The alt fire can break shields and travel through protective energy fields. The ice spell is essentially a submachine gun. The rate of fire is extremely high, but the damage for each hit is a little on the lower side. The range is quite good, but aim stability is not. That is, unless you put a decent amount of levels into raising it. The alt fire is essentially a multi-target homing submachine gun, causing ice shards to rain down from above on different enemies simultaneously. Despite having the lowest damage per hit, the speed of the projectiles is so high that the DPS for ice ends up being borderline game breaking. Like the Metal Blade in Mega Man 2, once you have the ice spell, you'll only use another weapon in very special cases. The fire spell is essentially your shotgun class. Heavy spread on the fire, high mana usage, short range, but hits like a truck. The alt fire is more like an explosive which leaves the sniper class to the lightning spell. Extremely long range, extremely high damage per hit, really high MP usage. The alt fire targets a selection of ground and creates an area of effect that disappears over time. Enemies you'll notice attack with the same basic principles of balance. And while a rock, paper, scissors approach to enemy weaknesses is borderline implied in choosing what weapons to attack with, you'll almost never need to consider it with the ice spell in your arsenal. Bosses, on the other hand, are another story. Kind of. By that, I mean ice is still the answer more often than not, but their methods of attack are quite different and easily the highlight of the game. There's not an insane amount of bosses, and a couple of them are reused in the optional areas, but by and large, they all offer a new challenge in learning their movesets, reading their tells, learning the optimal ways to dodge and parry, and find the sometimes narrow window to attack within. Early on, I found some of the bosses to be pretty steep walls to overcome, especially this one here that occurs just ahead of the halfway point. Point. And at points, the bosses were a source of frustration that really shined a light on some of the game's flaws and shortcomings. Some camera control issues, for instance, or even light and smoke effects that can, at times, completely mask a boss from your line of sight, making it impossible to know what attack is coming next or how to avoid it. It can feel cheap, and beating your head against the wall of cheapness isn't always fun. In saying all this, though, the difficulty curve needs to be addressed. We're 
most games maybe have a peak of difficulty early on while you're learning and then revert to a steady climb to the end, Nabeta has a steep climb until about the 40% mark of the game, then drops off a cliff and gets very, very easy. Now that isn't to say that there isn't occasional challenges or that the enemies can't drop your life to zero with a lucky hit, but nothing comes close to the difficulty found in the first half. Your tools quite frankly just become too powerful, and most deaths experienced later on are due to player carelessness and not knowing what to expect. That all said, power tripping is fun. And I'm tired of pretending it's not. So I don't mind the lack of balance here. If anything, the ease of progression only made it more enjoyable as it went along. The environments don't offer a lot to marvel over, so being able to move through them at a steadier pace is easily a benefit to me. Otherwise, all we have to look at is some technical aspects, and there's really not that much to talk about. You can see the game here on your screen, so you know how it looks. It runs at a steady 60 frames per second here playing the PS4 copy on my PS5, but to my knowledge, the performance is one-to-one -one with the PS4. This sound design is a little on the cheaper side, which can be said about the vast majority of the game, but they fill all the important spaces. The OST also isn't exactly filled with many bangers, but it puts a nice ambience into the background that I didn't really find myself getting tired of. Of course, your mileage may vary depending on how long you get stuck in any given area. Controls seem responsive enough for the speed of the game, but a warning is needed for those planning to start it up for the first time. The base camera controls are absurdly awful, and you'll want to adjust them immediately. This this title does offer a new game plus mode that scales the enemies up and allows you to start over, and there is a suite of achievements for those looking to hunt for them. Most of the dialogue in the game is also voiced, and the voice actors do a fine enough job. Though there was a controversy around the game's release due to many of the voice cast being sourced from VTuber Sensations Hololive. So where does this leave me with Little Witch Nobita, aside from not really knowing how to pronounce her name? Well. I like it. A lot, honestly. For all its rough edges and barren locations, I found it carried a certain magic I always love coming across. That magic of a small studio trying something way bigger than their budget would normally allow. To hit their marks, the scales need to be toned down all over the place. Environments are a little more empty, animations maybe a little more stiff, textures a little more murky, and gameplay a little more janky. Yet, all of its shortcomings and a few unique design choices ensure it's anything but a boring, derivative, run of the mill, been there, done that type of experience. Little Witch Nabeta has that same magic I fell in love with in a lot of Vita games. These big console level experiences being squeezed into a handheld where they didn't quite belong, turning their concessions into experiences. It's not a perfect experience, but mechanical perfection is a thin wire to walk on. If you walk it too straight, you risk homogenizing your craft to the point of boredom inducing predictability. Small elements of chaos go a long way to stop stoking the flames of engagement. And Little Witch Nabita contains a light enough dash of this chaos, both by design and by concession, that I found myself consistently engaged from beginning to end. Little Witch Nabita is basically a Vita game, and that's rad as hell to me. Let's bust.